Welcome to First Baptist Church Indian Trail. Take your Bibles, if you will, and look with me to Matthew, the sixth chapter. You know, uh, what makes that song so powerful uh, is, of course, the Holy Spirit, but uh, it's a guy singing his own experience. Uh, you know, the word tells us that uh, we are to take our faults and failures, the forgiveness of them, and we are to share that with other people. Well, Joseph goes, Joseph goes around the country um, telling his story of how God delivered him uh, from the bondages and addictions in this life. And uh, th there's nothing more powerful uh, than for God to take one of those that is a trophy of his grace, display him uh, with great power. And of course, we have heard uh, and been witnesses of that today. And so it brings you to the time when you may be asking yourself, <clears throat> what about me? Uh, why do I keep making the same old mistakes over and over again? Um, we, we get in this vicious cycle of confessing our sins and then right on the heels of confessing our sins to God with great good intentions, we say to God, God, I don't ever intend to do that any, anymore. And it won't be any time after that until all of a sudden we are confessing the same old thing over again and then with good intentions go before God and say, God, I, I don't ever intend to do that uh, anymore. And then failure and then guilt, and then confession, and good intentions, and failure, and guilt, confession. A lot of people live their lives like that. Matter of fact, if truth be known, we are all like that to a great degree. But let me help you with something. Good intentions are never enough. Good intentions are never going to deliver you. Good intentions don't have the power to set you free. Uh, our text this morning is found in verse 13, uh, and it is uh, the Lord's Prayer, if you will. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. Now, here's, here's the truth of the matter. Um, last week, we dealt with uh, as we forgive others. The week before, uh, we, we were asking for um, forgiveness for our own sin. For, forgive us, two weeks ago, as we forgive others last week. We wouldn't have to use forgive us or forgive us as we forgive others if we didn't give in to temptation ourselves. We wouldn't even need those other two sermons. 1 Corinthians chapter 10, verse 13 says that the temptations that you and I face in this life are absolutely no different than the temptations that everybody else faces in their life. Uh, I hear people, maybe you've said it, um, nobody knows the temptations that I face. Um, we've heard people say, um, uh, people don't understand what I am confronted with. Well, the fact of the matter is, um, you are not that unique because the Bible tells us that we all face temptations, every one of us. Uh, but here's the good part of that, that passage. God is faithful who will not suffer you to be tempted above that you are able to bear. In other words, God says that, uh, yeah, every one of us are unique. All of us face temptations. But you're never going to face temptations that are so strong that they always are going to overcome you. They, they don't have to overcome you. You don't have to give in. I've heard people say, I can't help it. Well, that's a lie. The truth is, temptation is a choice. You have a choice that is before you to do the right thing or the wrong thing. Uh, God says, I will keep the temptation 
from becoming so strong that you can't stand up against it. And the Bible says that he will show you a way out so that you don't have to give in to it. So I want to talk to you this morning because this is a different kind of prayer that we're going to be praying. Uh, it really is a prayer uh, of freedom, a prayer of freedom. Here it goes. You ready? Number one, and they all begin with an A. Acknowledge the areas of your weakness. Now, I don't have to get you to identify what temptations you face. You all in the room can name and identify the temptations. I'm not talking about that. Uh, I'm talking about uh, for you to identify the areas uh, of temptation that you face. Uh, why are you tempted there? The, the question is not what is the temptation. The question is, why are you tempted in that area? And what makes you susceptible to that particular temptation uh, that you face in your life on and on and on? Now, if you're serious about dealing with your temptations, that's one of the things that you're going to have to do is identify why you're being tempted there. Matthew chapter 26, verse 41, the Bible says, watch and pray lest you enter into temptation. Notice there are two things there. Uh, he said, not only do I want you to pray about the area that you are being tempted, I want you to watch, I want you to identify, uh, I, I want you to have an awareness of the area that this temptation is coming from. The spirit indeed is willing, but the flesh is Weak. Did you know that the spirit is willing? So understand something and go right back to what I told you at the beginning of the message. Willpower is not enough to overcome temptation. Um, so how many of you sitting out here this morning can identify with that? Uh, there was a time uh, that uh, I smoked cigarettes. And I want to tell you, I quit a million times. I didn't want to smoke. I didn't want to smell like that. Uh, I, didn't, I didn't want to do that to my lungs and my body. And, and I just, I, I, it's willpower, willpower, good intentions, good intentions. But I'm going to tell you what, that never delivered me. Uh, some of you can identify uh, with that as well. Weight loss. God help us. How many of us have all the good intentions in the world? Uh, in that area, but and all of the willpower that you could muster up has never been able to help you to overcome areas uh, like that. So notice what he says. He says, pray, and I want you to watch. What, what does he mean, watch? He's talking about watching for circumstances uh, that arise that is going to create an atmosphere where you are going to be tempted. Now, here's the thing about it. There, there's not... We're like snowflakes. There's not a person in this room that has another person exactly like you. Our DNAs are all stamped differently and we're all born differently with different inclinations and every one of us in here are uniquely designed by God to live this particular life that we are living in. And uh, here's the deal. What tempts you may never tempt me. And what tempts me uh, would never necessarily bring uh, temptation to you. There are certain situations that arise that tempt you and others are not tempted in the same situations. Why? Because you are uniquely designed, uniquely gifted. Some of you grew up differently uh, than others. You grew up maybe uh, in an atmosphere of anger and hostility uh, that was pervasive in your home day after day after day and that was transmitted to you and you came out of that environment with those same kind of tendencies uh, and inclinations. Whereas somebody else, uh, would not be tempted in that area because they were fostered uh, in a home of love and acceptance and significance. 
So we're all uniquely different. We're made by God different and we grew up different. We have different kind of areas of life uh, that we came up in. So genetically, we are different. Circumstantially, we are different. One of the things that I've been more sensitive about, I guess now since my grandson passed um, you know, last May, is uh, how we view people. You understand something, uh, we are all tempted differently. And you don't have any right whatsoever to look down your nose at somebody that may be facing drug addiction in their life and saying, I just don't see how they could possibly do something like that. While at the same time, somebody may be looking at you and saying, I don't see how they gossip and look down their nose at people like they do when they've got the issues going on in their own life. Amen. How could we look down at our nose with people that have temptations and same-sex attraction? Uh, we look down at our nose at um, people who are, are tempted in areas that uh, maybe we don't have that uh, temptation. Maybe it's uh, por uh, pornography or overeating uh, or gossip or drugs and we, we, we just somehow got to get past and understand that they're tempted in areas that we're not and we have our own issues so we don't have a right to you get my point? You tracking with me here? You, you don't have a right to say to anybody, my sins are okay, but yours are nasty, or how could anybody do something like that? We don't have that right. Let me tell you something, friend. <laughs> Satan knows what your weaknesses are. And, and while you're sleeping at night, he's scheming at night trying to figure out how in the world he's gonna come at you the next morning. And if you don't meet the devil head on, the next morning when you wake up, in all probability, you're going in the same direction he's going. Um, so we, we've got this genetic deal going on, and we've got this deal going on where, you know, where we grew up differently, and so we've got circumstantial and we've got genetics uh, that are facing. So uh, a couple of questions that I want to throw out here at you for just a minute, and I want you to really drill down with me um, so ask yourself the question, uh, when am I the most tempted? Is there a particular day of the week that you have a more difficult time with temptation uh, than uh, maybe another day of the week? Is there a time of the day uh, when you may be tempted more? Uh, I'm gonna tell you, <laughs> From 6 o'clock until about 11 o'clock at night, uh, uh, man, I, I robbed a refrigerator and I'll eat everything in the refrigerator and, 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 and sometimes just be tempted to go buy another refrigerator so I can have two uh, to deal with the temp. You, you, you get my point here? So when are you the most tempted? When does that face? Where are you the most tempted? Is it at work? Uh, is it with your family? God help us with temptation in our own families to, to be grumpy and, 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 and to anger. and all. So where are you? Is it with friends uh, that you hang with? Well, so where are you? Is it in front of a computer? So you gotta identify, all right, when am I the most tempted and where am I the most tempted? And third, who is with me when I am the most tempted? There, there's a lot of people that you can hang around that you're going to be more tempted with them than anybody else. So uh, who is that? By the way, you can't soar with the eagles when you're running with the turkeys. Um, then you've got to figure out what's the payback. Because the fact of the matter is when you give in to temptation, it is always for some kind of gratification. There's always a payback. There's, there, there's always something in return that you get when you, so you gotta identify what's the return. If I yield to this temptation, what do I hope to get in return uh, for it? Because the fact of the matter is, don't deceive yourself, um, sin is pleasurable. Sin is fun. If there were no attraction, if there was not something out there that 
fed you by yielding to the temptation, you would never give in to it. So Satan always makes sure that sin has pleasure in it. But hang on, the Bible says that it's just temporary. Uh, it, it's just for a short period of time. And uh, here, here's one that, that uh, man, I'd really encourage you to contemplate and think about is uh, how do you feel right before the temptation hits you? Are you frustrated? Are you angry? Are you tired? Uh, are, are, you, are, are you stressed out in some fashion? So it, it's really very helpful to understand that when you get that way, when you get mentally and physically tired, that, uh, man, that's when the enemy is going to come. Is it when you are bored? Is it when you're restless? Is it when you don't sleep as much as you ought to sleep and get the rest that you ought to get? So you got to... What, what, what kind of feeling do I have uh, right before the temptation comes? So uh, my encouragement to you here is acknowledge the area where your weaknesses are. All right, second, arrange ahead of time. What, what do you mean by that? Well, I think the scriptures are real clear in Proverbs 4 the, in verse 26. Ponder the path of your feet and let all your ways be established do not turn to the right or the left. Um, remove your foot from evil. Hey, hey, let me, you, you can't wait until you get in the middle of the temptation to determine what kind of action that you're going to take at that point. The Bible tells us in Proverbs here, establish your way, plan ahead, uh, arrange things in your mind that, when and if I ever get into that kind of situation, this is exactly how I'm going to respond. Here is what I'm going to do uh, in the midst of it. I, I tell young people that when I occasionally have the opportunity to speak to uh, uh, students uh, about their dating life, I always tell them, you, you need to plan ahead what you're going to do that evening. Don't ever let a young man pick you up and, and you don't know uh, where you're going to, young men, don't ever go on a date without knowing, okay, I'm going to pick her up. Uh, we're going here and we're going to do this. We're going here and we're going to do that. And then I'm going to have her back home at such and such a time. And the scheduling of the date so that you don't wind up in a back seat somewhere doing something that you should have never been involved in to begin with. So plan ahead. Um, here, here's the issue. Temptation always begins with a natural desire and takes these God-given desires that he's given to us and use them in wrong ways at the wrong time in the wrong amount. Um, food's good. And you know, we talked about that. I make fun of myself about this stuff. I enjoy eating. I went and got yesterday. I did something I probably shouldn't have done. Um, I, I love bologna sandwiches. I, I don't even know what bologna sandwiches, I don't know what bologna, what in the world is bologna made out of? I, I mean, everybody, I mean, they, yeah, do you know what that's made of? No, but I know it's good. You know? T taking the, you know, food is a, necessary in this life. The desire for good food is a God-given thing for us. We have to have it. Temptation is taking those God-given desires and using them for the wrong reasons in the wrong amounts. Fire, fire's a good thing. You, you, you gotta stay warm, but it also can burn the house down. And when you take what God gives you and using it for wrong reasons uh, in the wrong ways, in the wrong amounts, at the wrong times, it then becomes sin. So go ahead and plan ahead. You, you know if you go to a sports bar, what's going to happen to you? You know if you get before a computer and the conditions are just right, you know what's going to happen. Um, you, you, you just have to 
stay away from those times and those circumstances that you know that are going to create a situation where you're going to be tempted. Um, let, let, by the way, here's a saying uh, we, we used to have, if you don't want to get stung, then stay away from the bees. All right? Uh, number three, assess your heart. Um, boy, I, I spent a long time really um, challenging myself into this area so that I could challenge you uh, here. You, you understand, when the Bible talks about your heart, it is a symbol of your inner self. Your heart is the source of all of your behavior. Now, I'm, I'm going to build this in the next few minutes. Um, you know, temptation does not start out here. Temptation originates right here. Um, here's the word. Who may ascend into the hill of the Lord or who may stand in his holy place? He who has clean hands and a pure heart. Um, you understand what God did, does here in the scriptures is that he links inseparably what we do with who we are. The hands and the heart are inseparably linked uh, together. We do what we do because we are who we are. Uh, Matthew chapter 15 says this, but these things which proceed out of the mouth come from the heart and they defile a man. What, what, not what goes in, but what, where, it's originated here. It starts here. The defilement here, it, it's not the outside coming in, it's the inside going out. For out of the heart proceeds evil thoughts. Murders, adulteries, fornications, thefts, false witness, blasphemies. These are the things which defile a man. And so the wisest man uh, outside of the Lord Jesus who has ever lived said, keep your heart, guard your heart with all diligence for out of it comes the issues of this life. So he says to us, assess your heart, guard your heart, protect your your heart, because that's where the temptation is going to originate. All this other stuff are just triggers that's like a magnet that pulls out what's already on the inside. James chapter 1, verse 14. But each one is tempted. Watch it. Each one is tempted when? He is drawn away by his own desires and enticed. You understand, if your heart is already holding on to unforgiveness and anger and bitterness and jealousy and envy uh, and fear, these all negative kind of emotions that exist already uh, in your heart, uh, these issues that you already possess in your heart only give the devil the opportunity to build a stronghold in your heart. Um, excuse me, Ephesians 4.27 says, don't give the devil a foothold. Don't give him a foothold. Uh, when that happens, all of a sudden you hear these little voices and they begin to whisper in your ear. You deserve to be happy. You, you deserve to have some enjoyment in this life. Uh, you, you deserve better than what you have. Look at what you could have versus what you have. And he whispers there, you deserve to be loved. Can I just say a word to every one of you that are listening here today? Uh, that is not God. Number four, simply ask the Lord to help you. Ask the Lord to help you. Notice the passage. 
lead us not. God, Heavenly Father, lead us not into temptation. He's asking for help. I don't know where we get this notion of prayer being like it is. You know, prayer oftentimes can be microwaved. It's not always, oh, Lord God of the universe and some kind of flowery terminology. You know, a lot of effective prayer life is microwaved and just simply says, help! The Bible is filled with great men of God who walked in the power and the freedom of the Holy Spirit. Uh, that, that, that They didn't have a 5,000 word prayer. It was simply... Help. Think about Simon Peter when he was walking on the water. He looks down and all of a sudden he begins to sink. Oh my word, did he ever just cry out, help me. Um, Psalm 50 says, call upon me in your day of trouble and I will deliver you and you'll honor me. Just call out to me. Yet you understand something. God is very sympathetic with where you are in your life. God is very sympathetic and empathetic with what you are facing and what you're dealing with and the confrontations that you are going through. As a matter of fact, the Bible even says that the Lord Jesus himself was tempted in every fashion that you and I will ever be tempted with, yet without sin. He understands what you're facing. He knows what you're going through. You say, wait a minute, you saying to me that Jesus faced sexual temptation? Yes. Are you saying to me that Jesus got tired and maybe got a little bit uh, tempted to be cranky? Yes. But he didn't sin. He was tempted he never gave in. Why is that? He had the freedom to choose. I can choose to yield and to give in and to be overcome by this or I can choose to let the power of my heavenly father enable me to look for the escape route and he looked and he found the escape route every time that he was ever tempted and it was never overcome. Number five, and this is so very, very important. I think these next two um, are very, very important. Alter your thinking. Alter your thinking. Uh, if you're sitting in front of a television and something uh, comes up on that television that you know that you ought not to be watching, flip the channel. That's what I'm talking about mentally. When something hits your brain and temptation begins to uh, flood your mind, flip the channel. Alter your thinking and just say, I'm not going to watch that. I'm not going to give any time in my mind for what I am being tempted in. I, I've, I've got some guys that I meet with on a regular basis, and, and I've taught this principle for years and years and years. It's called the three R's, and I've done it here on a Sunday morning a time or two, and, and I, I just kind of remind people, uh, it, it's, it's first of all, when you hit temptation and something comes into your mind, the first thing that you do is that you recognize that's something that I ought not to be entertaining. And the second R is I reject that thought in the name of Jesus. I, I recognize, no, no, this is not from God. I know where this is from. And then you come right on the heels of that and say, in the name of Jesus, I, I reject that. But now I want to tell you something. You can recognize it and you can reject it all you want to, but until you get to that third R that you refocus your thinking and, 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 and you change and you alter your thinking, it, you're never going to get victory over it. You have to begin to replace it. That's the R. You replace it with something that is good and healthy and wholesome. Maybe a gospel song, a passage of scripture, or something that is going to honor God in your mind. And so you do these uh, three R's. You, you can listen. Whenever you resist, whatever you resist, 
you're going to persist. I can't tell you the numbers of years that I said, I'm not going to smoke that cigarette. I'm not going to smoke that cigarette. I'm not going to smoke that cigarette. And, and whatever I try, and however I try to resist it, my wife will tell you, it's the most frustrating time in my life. I'm not going to yield to that. I, I'm, I, whatever you resist, you're going to persist. And until you replace it, it's always going to be prevalent in your life. You're always going to face it. Uh, we are to resist the devil, but we are to flee temptation. I, I don't know this is probably a good time. I, I was pastor here. I had just come, and I was right over here on 74, and uh, I, I'd, I'd, been, I'd quit smoking for 11 years. 11 years. And the desire for a cigarette hit me. I'm pastoring my third church right here. The desire to smoke a cigarette hit me just out of the clear blue, invaded my mind. If I had resisted, I'd have had a pack before the sun went down. But what I did is I said, that's not of God. And I replaced it in my thinking. I replaced it in my mind and uh, never had another issue. We're to resist the devil, but we are to flee temptation. And once, once I refocus my attention, once I refocus my thinking and get on the things of God rather than what I'm being tempted with, suddenly I'm not interested in that anymore. And Satan then is going to have to come at me from an entirely different direction. And I can tell you this, um, refocusing your thinking works in every area of your life of temptation. Uh, Psalm 119, when I look at your commandments, Psalm 119 verse 6, write that down somewhere. Uh, when I look at your commandments, I will praise you with uprightness of heart. What is he saying right there? When I focus in on the things of God, then my behavior is going to follow suit. When I focus in on truth, when I focus in on your word, when I focus in on the things of God, I don't have any room in my life for anything else. And so I'm going to walk in righteousness uh, and uh, in truth. Uh, 2 Corinthians 10 says, bringing every thought into captivity to the obedience of Christ. That is the key to overcoming. That is the key to freedom. It takes practice. You're not good at it. So it takes a lot of practice. And uh, here's the deal. You can't control the circumstances uh, that come your way. And you can't always control how you feel in your heart and in your mind. But I want to tell you what you can control. You can control what you think about it. And that's a choice. Uh, that's a choice. Um, you remember how Jesus dealt with it 40 days in the wilderness, 40 days in fasting and in prayer. And he comes out of that 40-day experience hungry and tired, physically worn out, spiritually spent. I mean, he's just, and Satan comes on him and he says, hey, turn those rocks into bread. Do you think Jesus was hungry? Sure he was hungry. Turn those rocks into bread. Man, that's a good idea. Why didn't I think about that? Boy, if I, that would sure satisfy the hunger that I'm facing right now, this gnawing. And, but he didn't focus on that, did he? He refocused on the things of God and he replaced that temptation in his mind and in his thinking. He says, the word says, man shall not live by bread alone. Um, Romans chapter 12 says, don't let evil conquer you, but conquer evil with good. That, that's the principle of uh, replacement. It's fill your mind with something good. Re recognize I, I, this is not of God. Reject it in the name of Jesus. They overcame him by the word of their testimony and by the word of God, by the word of their testimony, the blood of the lamb, I reject it. And then you take that third step and you refocus your thinking on something that you know that is pleasing unto God. So 
You're going to acknowledge your areas of weakness. You're going to plan ahead and arrange ahead of time. How are you going to uh, live in the midst and the face of temptation? You're going to guard and assess your heart and, and make sure that it's right with God. And then you're just simply going to ask God for help. And then you're going to alter the way that you think. But if you leave this next one out, I don't think that it's going to be very effective for you. Uh, you have to acquire a spiritual friend. Willpower is not enough. The change has to come from within inside. And so the question is, how serious are you about being free? And I can tell you, you're not going to be able to do it without support. We need each other. I, that's the most distressing thing that I've, I believe that we have had to face in 2020 is that uh, being isolated from each other. We need each other. We need uh, community and we've got to have accountability and, and you've got to be able to develop and acquire a friend somewhere around you that is going to ask you the tough questions and check up on you. Listen to Ecclesiastes. Two are better than one. Because together if one falls down, the other can help him up. But if somebody's alone and he falls, there is no one there to help him up. Isolationism just doesn't work. Trying to do it by yourself will miserably fail. You have to have somebody in your life that you trust. And go back a few weeks ago and, and go the guidelines that uh, I shared with you on how to discover and find that friend and the qualities that that friend must have. But you cannot do this by yourself. You can, you, inevitably, there are some that are watching today and some that are maybe even here. What's the big deal about this? Well, what's this stuff of... I don't face temptation. That's the biggest lie. I don't care how long you've walked with God, how spiritually mature you think that you are, every one of us face temptation. If Jesus faced it, who in the world do we think that we are that we're not going to? You never get spiritually mature to the point that you then cease facing temptation. As a matter of fact, one of the books that I would love if uh, ever had the opportunity to write, I know what the title of it would be. It would be Headwinds. Headwinds. I used to run track when I was uh, in uh, school, and uh, w one of the things that I noticed is that last 100 yards was the most difficult. And it just seemed to me like that the wind was always in my face on that last hundred yards. And I can tell you from experience and I can tell you from talking with other people uh, and ministering as a pastor, it is true as you are walking with God that that headwind comes at you in temptation in amazing ways, amazing ways. If men would learn how to deal with with temptation, then they wouldn't have to confess their sins. If men would confess their temptation to other men, then they would not be in a position where they'd have to confess the sin. If women would confess their temptations with other women, they wouldn't be in a place where they would have to confess their sins before God. Galatians chapter 6 is one of my favorite, favorite New Testament passages. The Bible says, if anybody be overtaken in a fault, ye which are spiritual, restore such a one in the spirit of meekness, lest you be tempted likewise. We need each other. We're to be in the restoration business with people that are overcome by temptation. Listen to James 5 and I'll close. Verse 19. And this comes from a uh, paraphrase. My dear friends, if you know people who have wandered off from God's truth, don't write them off. Go after them. Get them back and you will have rescued precious lives. We need each other. Would you stand with me and let's pray together? Um, let, let, let me spend just a minute of 
time, if I could, just praying for you and seeking the Lord on your behalf. Uh, I think it's a big deal that we face in temptation. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. Let's pray together. Father, I just pray for this body of believers that are virtual, and I pray for these body of believers that are here. We acknowledge the fact that, Lord, we do face temptations in our life. We acknowledge the fact that none of us enjoy being overcome by temptation. And going through a cycle of confessing our sin with good intentions, only to fail and experience the guilt and the shame of that failure and then confess good intentions and failure following us time after time. We're tired of that. And God, we want to be set free. So, Lord, I pray in the name of Jesus today that you would help us to just really acknowledge the areas of weakness. When do we get tempted and where do we get tempted and who's around us when we get tempted? And God, help us to determine just not put ourselves in the places where that's going to happen. The people that's going to happen. Lord, help us to uh, establish now uh, what we would do in the face of temptation. Help us to put a game plan in place right now of how we're going to act and how we're going to deal with it as it arrives. God, help us not to wait until we get in the throes of it. God, help us to assess our heart day after day after day. And God, don't let anything be in our heart that is going to give Satan an opportunity to build a foothold and a stronghold in us. Lord, that is going to bring about more temptation and drag out of us what's there. God, I pray that we'd always seek you and Lord, ask you for help. Lord, you, you want to help us a whole lot more than what we want to be helped. So help us to cry out to you. And God, I, I pray that we would always come to grips with the fact that we can't dwell on those things that are tempting us. We have to refocus and rethink. God, we got to get our minds off that stuff and get our minds on the things, God, that is going to be healthy and wholesome to us. God, we, we can't control what hits our minds, but God, we can control how long we let it stay there and, and we can control, Lord, uh, that part of the area of temptation. Help us to reject it and replace it. God, help us to do something that uh, most people just are so resistant to do. And that's get accountable to somebody else. Help us to step out of our own comfort zones and reach out to somebody that we know that we can trust. Somebody spiritual enough to handle Lord, what we would share with us without judgment. Sure love you today. In Jesus' name. Thank you for watching Decision for Life. Our location, life group, and program information are available online at fbcit.org. We hope you will take the opportunity to join us in person. Thank you from the family of First Baptist Church Indian Trail.